Hello and welcome to An Evening with Nirvana. It's a podcast where I'm talking to a series of guests from the Doom community and some people outside of it about level design, map creation, and other facets of game development. Today on the podcast, I'm talking to Dario Casali, co-creator of the Plutonia Experiment, contributor to Memento Mori, and one of the early members of Valve, where he's worked on Half-Life, Half-Life 2, Portal 2, the Left 4 Dead games, Team Fortress 2, Half-Life Alex, and many more projects. He also has a YouTube channel where he swears at some of his old maps and other people's. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today, Dario. How are you doing? Thank you so much. Uh, doing great. Thanks. Uh, that's... I have to, have to remind everybody that I comically uh, censor my swear words in my YouTube channel because, uh, you know, for kids. <laughs> well, I think it's one of those things where it actually makes it funnier, like the censoring. <laughs> I think. Yeah, I, I certainly enjoy it because uh, it's a lot more entertaining than just hearing me raging at <laughs> Doom content. Well, yeah, I think it goes from making it you know sound like genuine anger into you know (laughs) now it's the thing a bit more silliness yeah yeah exactly it is it's a lot of fun uh getting back into doom though um there's just so much great content out there and um sometimes i get caught up in the fight at the time and i start getting grumpy but then i realize as soon as it's over this is just so much fun and i never wanted those swear words or expletives to come across the wrong way to people who are watching this um so it's just much better to keep it light-hearted i think yeah i mean i'm a little bit <laughs> i'm a little bit the same way where i can be a bit like reactionary yes and, like, exactly you know, but then after the fight i'm like you know that was actually a pretty good encounter like I'm not actually that salty I think about it's, it, I it's, be- it's because the game is so it, it draws you in so much um i just really get into what i'm playing and sort of lose myself in it for a second and I, th- I think that's just a, a statement of how good the content is or actually <laughs> and it can be the opposite way sometimes the content's so terrible that i'm moved to massive amount of language um <laughs> for example i've just been playing through tnt evolution um oh, wow. actually i just just today i published the first eight of those walkthroughs and um it just just gets it just gets ugly. You got some problems. I mean, I did want to touch on <laughs> TNT a bit later, ugly. but <laughs> yeah, I haven't played that for at least twenty years, maybe longer. Um, mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I I wasn't a fan. Well, map eight is metal, right? Which is definitely a map to have some expletives at, if I remember correctly. Map eight is metal. Yeah, I think that's the last one I put out today. Uh, I'm going to put another eight out tomorrow morning when I finish editing them. Yeah. Well, I am actually a bit of a TNT fan. Uh, I, <laughs> okay. I Maybe do... you shouldn't watch these. <laughs> <laughs> no, I fully like it's it's a pretty common opinion in the in the um, community that TNT is like <laughs> not a very good I would, but uh, I don't know. I I like the. I think I like the weirdness of it. I think the more you make maps for Doom the more you tend to look for, like, sort of weird, unique level design elements. And TNT has a lot of very strange choices, like massive (laughs) open areas that expand onto nothing, really. (laughs) Areas that have, like, no point progression-wise. Or no particular style or, like, art treatment or... Yeah, yeah. I, I did. I wandered into a lot of spaces like that where I was like, "Wow, this this seems either rushed or unloved or something like that." I couldn't explain it. Yeah, sometimes yeah, I can understand that perspective, but uh... and it varied too. Like there were some good maps in there. There were some you can really tell that this was done by a diverse group of people across the internet because the styles and the quality is incredibly inconsistent. Community project syndrome. I think you would call it in the Duke. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's one of the things I liked about uh, working with just my brother on Plutonia is that we had this sort of consistency. We had this um, stability where we only had one other person to answer to. Um, so there wasn't a lot of time and energy used on squabbling or 
adapting to people or you know like trying to figure out communication to solve problems like we just didn't have any of those incumbent uh any any of those things encumbering us so mm -hmm. i think i think that was a benefit yeah and i guess also i mean it's not just one other person but it's your brother so you know <laughs> there's a lot True. behind that relationship and uh probably an understanding of like you know you're both reliable in terms of getting the product out. Yeah, I think we have a lot, a lot of mutual respect for one another because we had developed maps uh, just sort of in parallel for at least a year prior to that. So we'd seen what we could do. We'd sort of polished our own skills of level design together at the same time. You know, always sharing ideas of what to do, how to do it, and I think yeah, just. We already had that rapport, not just as brothers, but as people who had honed their Doom level design skills basically in the same room. Mm -hmm. So I guess just to go back a bit uh, to my usual first question for people on the podcast, uh, what was your initial introduction to Doom? Um, it was at a friend's house. Um, his dad was a pilot for British Airways and he always flew through Singapore. So I guess he always got this, he always came back with these CD-ROMs full of software. Uh, so this guy always, always had the new games before I could see them, you know, mm -hmm. before they came out for me, you know, on magazines or whatever. So I was at his house um, and I saw him playing Doom and I thought, wow, this is amazing. And also he, his dad was, you know, he had a proper computer. He had like a 486-33 or something and I was on my... Yep. 38640 at home, uh, which could basically be a word processor and nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, so I saw, I saw the game running there. I thought, oh, wow, this is so much better than anything I've seen. Um, I want to get my hands on this. So uh, immediately I just played through the whole game, you know, like what, 10 frames a second or whatever it was that my computer could do. <laughs> and I had a really shrunk down postage stamp sized screen. Um, but it was awesome anyway. And I was hooked pretty much immediately. Mm -hmm. I feel like this story of the slightly better off friend with more video games than you is very common with people when they <laughs> started playing Doom. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it comes up a lot where it's like, uh, you know, oh, I had a friend and his dad was, like, uh, way better off than my dad and <laughs> bought them the games that they actually wanted and stuff. You know. That was definitely the case with me. Yeah, uh, that was the case with me. Actually, prior to Doom, uh, the very first game I played on a computer was SimCity, the original SimCity, and that was also with a friend uh, on a friend's computer who had a dad who I don't remember how he got hold of SimCity, but he was pretty wealthy. He's pretty well off, so I was playing on his computer as well. I guess you know, that's a thing. I was thinking the original, the original SimCity was Super Nintendo, but that's not the case, actually, right? Because I had a no, I think it was developed by Maxis on the PC, right? Nineteen eighty, yeah. I don't remember, like eighty six or eighty seven or something. Yeah, I think I've only seen like screenshots of that. Mm -hmm. I've played the um, what I think is the Super Nintendo version. I'm pretty sure, but that's uh, that's as far back as I go with SimCity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So when did you actually start? sort of making maps for Doom? And was that like the first game that you did any modding for? Or did you try and uh, like modify other games before that? Uh, that was the very first one I modified. Um, it was probably, I don't know, like maybe nine months to a year after Doom came out. And I'd been playing it so much. Uh, and then I would buy all of the computer magazines and all the computer game magazines um, on sale in those days because some of them had CD-ROMs on the front of them. So one of them had a CD-ROM that had a Doom level editor. And I just thought, oh my god, that is the best thing I can ever imagine at this point, being able mm -hmm. to make my own Doom maps because I'd played through all of them um, back, you know, basically front and back. And then... Milo and I connected our computers through serial cable and we started doing Deathmatch, which is, by itself was just the most amazing thing as well. Right. How cool is this? And we played so many hours that eventually uh, this level editor thing promised to give us pretty much unlimited new play spaces. So 
very first thing we did is we loaded it up um, and started placing barrels in E1, M1 from Doom, the deathmatch in shooting barrels, <laughs> basically <laughs> blowing each other up with barrels. That was the very first thing we tried, because that doesn't require any structural or any knowledge of how to do any kind of geometry whatsoever. You're just play th placing entities, placing things, I think they were called. Yeah. Uh, and then playing deathmatch in them. Um, and then, of course, you know, as we tired of that, we moved balls around. And if we tired of that, we started building things from scratch. Uh, eventually, we bit, yeah, building our own maps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think everyone's first, uh, you know, like inclination when they open the editor is how many cyber demons can I put down? Or, or you know, <laughs> Back then, uh, computers were so slow that. Um, you probably couldn't play more than a couple of those. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. was. Yeah, you got a lot of sprite glitching and stuff with vanilla. I, I also, well, I had a, we had a four eight six, so we had the advanced system, and even then, uh, it struggled quite a bit. Yeah, I think there were some hard limits in the Doom engine that you could exceed really easily with the number of sectors or line depths you had in view or something, and so you would just get those really long. Uh, artifacts, um, so we always we were always up against that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think well, Vizplane Overflow was the big one, which would just straight up crash the game if you had uh, too much going on that Doom guy could see uh, at once, kind of thing. And we were we were also so ravenous about playing the game and using the computer and editing that we hated sitting watching those. I don't know if you used the same Doom editor I did back in the day, but like, every time we compiled the map, we had to watch those green lines go across. And it would take so long on these computers. Mm -hmm. Is a Doom cat bigger map chance? Uh, let's see. I think... No, uh, I don't think so. I know I ended up using DEU, -E -E Doom Editing Utilities, and then DETH, Doom Editing for Total Head Cases. <laughs> Prior to DEU, I'm not sure what it was I used, honestly. It's like it's so long ago now. Mm -hmm. um, but every time it was building that BSP, there was that silly green line or that bar that had to fill up. And it took so long that we just thought, okay, I don't want to make a, a map bigger than this because the iteration cycle was just agonizing. Yeah, I used DoomCAD 95 and uh, it would do the same thing. It was like a bunch of sort of pink and white squares while it built the nodes and stuff. But... Uh, mm. It, it would crash out of the save sometimes, and if it did that, then you just lost <laughs> everything you just made. <laughs> oh, that happened a lot for us too, yep. Yeah, it was a nightmare. That yeah, was a lot of that happening. I was actually interested in the editor you guys used, because um, I think in Plutonia, like usually for, for Doom stuff, everything's done in increments of 8, or multiples of 8 rather. Uh, but with Plutonia, there's a lot of multiples of 10 used, I believe. Oh, uh, like you mean high like... variation and stuff. Huh. So for like for sector very uh, se yeah like sector heights they were multiples of ten instead of eight. I think yeah I believe that might be the case yeah. Well that wouldn't have been too smart because that makes texture alignment a lot harder. Well I think Plutonia has some weird brick textures actually that align better on the ten than oh, the eight okay. I believe. That must have been textures that we... Yeah, I mean, it's harder to... It's harder to author textures on, you know, the divisions of 10 because they have to... I mean, the, the, the GIF sizes have to be multiples of 8. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how we would have done that. Why we would have made our lives difficult? Is that is that actual... Is that factual or is that something... Uh... <laughs> well, I I believed it was until you sounded so shocked about it, and now. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I don't remember that honestly. I mean, it could be true. But it was a long time ago. Now I'm always but... wanting to crack open the editor to double check, but. Uh... You know, we authored our own textures, and I was in there with the grids and stuff, making them tiles. So I would have made them divisions of eight. I don't know why I would have at least authored the textures divisions of ten. That would have just. Was I? Did I enjoy making my life difficult back then? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. And so, also, uh, I was extremely, extremely um, careful about lining textures up. I mean, annoyingly so. I hated mi misaligned textures. Mm. Perhaps I'm thinking of uh, brightness or something to that effect. 
Maybe it's a it's a false memory I've implanted. <clears throat> Possibly. Now we need to know. We do, yeah. Uh... Well, <clears throat> I won't go through the rigmarole of checking now, but uh, someone out there we will listen to this and be that. like, you are incredibly wrong about this, and then I will hear about it. So, uh, I'm sure I'll be happy to be it. wrong, because then I'd, uh, maybe I would uh, dislodge some memories of... <laughs> some trauma that you have blacked out about. Yeah, this yeah. De deliberately concealed, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, like, Memento Mori now is like, a pretty legendary classic Doom mod uh, these days. Um, when you and Milo worked on it, did it actually sort of feel particularly special? Or was it just sort of a way to like cut your teeth on community Doom mapping? Um, uh, his oh, Mil Milo's name is pronounced Milo, by the way. Um, oh, sorry. That's all right. Um, Memento Mori, I. Did I have two maps in that? Or did Milo have one map? I don't remember. I think we just had one map in that, right? Might have just been Milo. Did I have one? No, I need to. I need to go out and go back and think about Memento Mori. Um, I don't even remember if that was before or after Plutonia. I think it might have been before. For, well, um, I remember. Probably. I mean, it was definitely released before Plutonia was before Final Doom was because it held on to Final Doom for I think five or six months after it was finished for some reason. Um, but I don't remember if I worked on those. I think I probably worked on those maps uh, before Final Doom mm -hmm. because I don't, think, I don't think I really worked on, I don't think I built anything after Final Doom other than those two slaughter wards, the uh, the, the Punisher uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, the Punisher. Because yeah. at that point, uh, Quake was coming out and I was starting to work with the Quake, Quake engine. So, yeah, I think Memento Mori was prior to, to Final Doom. So that would have been the very first time um, I built and submitted a map for a, like a, a multi-author map, map pack. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, this is not very helpful at all, but uh, my memories of Memento Mori are very... Uh, hazy at best. I just remember Dennis and Thomas Moller, or whatever their names, how do you pronounce them? I remember those names from back in those days, but that's about it. And maybe Ika? Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, well, well yeah, it not was very quite helpful. a long time ago. <laughs> I, well, I, you get this a lot with the Doom community stuff, because, you know, uh, a lot of people have been in the community for like 20 years or something, so they won't always remember exactly what was going on when they first started out. <laughs> I wish I could uh, go back and look at some email archives, but um, back then, email wasn't the same as it is now. Back then, I think, I mean, even emails that I was sending through TNT and ID to get Plutonia ready, those were like, I didn't even know what, we weren't using my Outlook, or there was no Gmail, like it was, AOL I think it was all through... Yes, yeah, whatever England's version of AOL was, um, and it was all handled by their servers, I guess. And we just sort of, we had these little PST files, which had all of the ridiculous information about how the email was going to be sent from one person to another, rather than just, you know, like subject line, who's it from? And then the, the body of the email, it was like all of this random crap beforehand. Right. Um, so I did save a couple of those, um, put them in text files, and I still have those, but most of that stuff has just gone forever. Um, it was all through uh, those Doom editing lists, the... We call those things news groups now. Oh. Uh, yeah, so most evidence of that's just gone, yeah, right. gone with time. Yeah, I was actually, well, I was just about to ask you actually when when you made the original maps that you sent to American McGee before uh, making Plutonia, what did you sort of try to put in those maps to impress the id team? I guess can you remember really? Um, the they weren't authored originally for id. Um, okay. They were, so they were authored when we were working with TNT on this map pack that was going to come out. Uh, we were going to release it for free. And we were already encountering... Like, Milo and I were not terribly satisfied with how that was going. Because um, we saw some maps that were 
entered into that and we just thought i just don't think these these are not interest these are not of interest to us we we didn't want to we'd played so much doom up to that point that we didn't want to retread any ground really that doom 2 had treaded if we could help it yeah and so we always tried to push the boundaries to push the limits somewhere and sometimes that was really really spiking the difficulty sometimes it was trying to use monsters in ways they hadn't been before in combinations they hadn't been before stuff like that we always tried to come up with a new idea and i think that didn't really gel too well with the style of tnt which was a lot more conservative uh, a lot safer and so even before there was any talk of tnt going to it or being sold in any commercial way whatsoever um we started to think um maybe we can do our own little thing here you know we were inspired by the fact that oh we can put a map pack together and have people play it that's not just us and that was really cool because we had taken our maps to local groups uh land parties and stuff and we would play deathmatch and we'd just bring our maps along and get people to play them and see what they thought and it was a, it was a really great feeling to put our work in front of somebody and have them enjoy it and so i think we were really uh, motivated by that um so we had already started working on maps that Either TNT team had rejected and say, I oh, know these are too difficult. Or we just thought, we don't want to put any more maps into TNT because we had already supplied with like, I think we at least gave them eight maps. Um, and six were going to be in there, I think. Two of them were rejected. And as soon as the, the, the map pack, well, as soon as TNT and ID reached an agreement, suddenly, oh, like four more of our maps were rejected for some reason. Uh, but anyway, uh, we had already begun working on something that we wanted to put out just as a team of two because we had a lot more control over the content and we felt like with TNT we disagreed too much with some of the content that was being put in there and we wanted to do our own thing. Yeah, I, um, I did want to ask you sort of about the differences in like <laughs> the ethos of TNT and Plutonium ones from a design perspective because obviously you like Pharaoh and Caribbean ended up in it, uh, uh, in the secret slots, <laughs> but um, right, yeah, because they don't really. I mean, it it sounds kind of ridiculous to say it, but they don't suit the style of TNT, um, which you know is all over the place, honestly. Yeah. Um, they're they're so non thematic to Doom, I guess that that's just fine for them to be in um, secret slots. But uh, yeah, we didn't. We didn't. So we didn't set out to answer your original question. We did not set out to impress Id at all. We just wanted to live up to our own standards of what we would be proud of having other people play and then have our names being associated with it. And that just sort of carried with it this insistence on a certain level of uniqueness, um, innovation, and not because those are like corporate goals of ours or anything it's just what we wanted to play we we'd played so much up to that point that we thought i don't want to play anything that has lazy texturing or bad lighting or traditional monster placement we've done that we've, we've played them hundreds of times and we'd rather go out and do something else than play doom in a map that is exactly it feels exactly the same as what we've done so that kind of enabled us to be very particular about the content we were making i think um, right. And I think just perhaps that philosophy was reflected in the work that we sent to American McGee at ID was just like, yeah, these, these maps are pretty different. Um, and we were also very obsessive about polishing them and making sure they looked professional and they looked good and, you know, weren't any obvious major bugs and stuff. So they, it was an easy prospect for somebody to play them and, and then sort of appreciate what we were trying to do. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I think having that sort of focus on your own goals is sort of a lot more important than, you know, attempting to do what you thought it would like, <laughs> I suppose. Right, yeah. Uh, it was, it, I guess it was lucky that what we liked playing, they also liked playing. I guess maybe there was a compatibility there. Mm -hmm. And was there much interaction with the id team during Plutonia, or was it just sort of a few emails here and there? Uh, there was not much interaction, no, because um, we'd already made, um, I believe, ten of them or so when right. I sent them, or eight, eight, eight or ten of them, I think. Um, then they said, yeah, finish, 
finish the 32 set and we're like oh shit we've got basically no time to do that um and then we were just heads down the whole time so uh when when the maps were done there was some back and forth about um getting the formatting of the textures right and you know just basically uh busy work um but there was there was never any direction like any um critical direction or any kind of like oh yeah i think you guys should try to do this more or that more it was they were totally totally 100 percent hands off on the content mm -hmm. and more just a matter of you know, what do we need to get this shipped well they did they did ask me um can you make can you can you give us some maps to uh, to to um replace some of the tmt maps i don't think i think there were some tmt maps they really didn't like and they never told me which ones they were, so I can't tell you which ones they were. But they did ask us to, to build more, and we just didn't have time. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, we were, we, were so, we, we were already so hard-pressed to hit that deadline that I just I couldn't. I mean, I would have loved, if I had more time, I would have done that, but I just didn't, didn't have time. I'm surprised I didn't just get Sandy Peterson to do it. That you seem like the workhorse who... <laughs> I, got think they were work I think they were working on Quake. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Um, so, you've touched on it a little bit, but uh, difficulty is kind of a big part of what made Plutonia notorious, uh, I guess, when it came out. Um, I'm wondering sort of what your th thoughts on creating challenging gameplay were back then, and how uh, your approach to like difficulty has changed over the years working at Valve. <clears throat> I think that uh back then it was yeah we were we were quite um we didn't have a i think we were we we were kind of mean to the player in in plenty of situations there were there was a lot of things we did that <laughs> the only way I can explain it is that I was playing Milo's maps and he was playing mine and the meaner he got, I thought, well, I guess I'm just going to do something like that for you then. So you can die in my map. I think I think killing each other in our maps was like a badge of honor or something. <laughs> like <death laughs> as ridiculous as that sounds. Vicariously through the map. <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, it's like, yeah, he's getting his revenge on me by doing, you know, spawning in a chain gunner right behind my back or something. Well, maybe yeah, that's what I did. Yeah. Um, so de I mean, definitely over the years at Valve, that we we wanted. I mean, I definitely moved away from a sort of a spiteful difficulty to more okay. of a, an accessible difficulty level, where you want to be a little more fair because you don't want players to drop out of the game after you know twenty five percent of the way in or something. Um, we built a lot of the well, all of the Valve games we built for consumption, as you know, like one hundred percent consumption if we could. Because um, nobody wants to be working on the part of the game that seventy-five percent of the people don't don't get to. So, yeah. um, uh, accessible was far more important than well, getting getting that balance right. Because you always have to have a challenge. Like if people don't have a challenge, then they just sort of it becomes a, a non-memorable ex experience. It becomes this sort of thing that you just sleep your way through, and you're not going to remember that two years, three years, ten years down the road. You're, you know. So there's always that balance of you've got to make it uh, provoking, provoking enough and interesting enough and thoughtful enough that it, it grabs their attention, but not so punishing that you know, they can't finish. Uh, that is always such a challenge for, for yeah. at least it has been for me as a game designer over the last 25 years. It does feel like it's sort of opened up a little bit. I want to say since uh, maybe the popularity of Dark Souls and... and games in that genre where it does feel yeah, like difficulty right. now is kind of there's an appreciation for that that roguelike style and and uh death being a little bit more punishing <laughs> in games and like understanding yep. that maybe players can handle a bit more punishment in games and stuff so it's been interesting watching it kind of there was sort of the big original uptick with difficulty for arcade style games and things and then it, it dropped a bit and now it's kind of you know, gone on a slightly upward trajectory, especially now that, like, Elden Ring was so massive as well. I'm sure that's had a big impact. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I haven't thought about that, but, it's, I mean, you're right. You're making a really good point, which is maybe hostility is making it come back. <laughs> maybe people like beating their heads against the wall. Uh, maybe that sense of accomplishment 
is worth more than the cost to get there. Um, but again, I bet you that's a, that's a, such a fine line to tread because you know, when you're when you're right on the edge of frustrating a player so they don't continue, you've got to have that hook to get them back in somehow. Yeah, I mean, it must also be like people like it's all about player expectations. I would imagine like a company like FromSoft, like they're known for challenge so they can afford to put these games out and people know what they're mm -hmm. getting themselves into right but if valve suddenly right. comes out with a game that is sort of uh at the dark souls level of difficulty or something then people may wonder like their expectations like may not be there and they may just sort of be turned off kind of thing yeah uh, i don't think that'll ever happen either <laughs> <laughs> yeah. knowing the, knowing the culture of valve i think all of our single player games going to have that sort of friendly edge to them so there'll yeah. be some there'll be a challenge but there's always going to be like we don't we don't like it when the play testers get frustrated and just sort of stop playing or just they they, they get visibly flustered we just you know, we, mm -hmm. we get nervous about stuff like that um so when we see that in play testing we we adjust the difficulty level yeah well i definitely <laughs> don't think of valve as someone who makes games that are like you know, particularly easy or anything. There's definitely some teeth to the Valve games when there needs to be. But um, <laughs> yeah, like especially the Strider battle at the end of Episode Two. Um, <laughs> right. I got I got endless shit for that, <laughs> especially internally, and it did start out a lot more difficult than it shipped. Yeah. Well, should have got him oh. to play some Plutonium maps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. I, again, you sort of touched on this a little bit with uh, working with Milo, but uh, based on interviews I've listened to, competition, it seems to be quite an important driving force for you in your work, or or at least it was uh, for Plutonia and stuff. I was wondering if that's still sort of an important part of like your creative process to have maybe someone on the dev team who you uh, sort of <laughs> want to compete with a little bit and, and make uh, levels that might give them a bit of trouble or something. Um, I don't think it's it's not the same in the development environment anymore. The the teams that I've been working on are so big now that there's not that sort of personal focus between, at least, I guess even on a big team, you can have a, a couple of people in a room. Actually, you know what? I'm going to back up a little bit. In Half-Life 2, mm -hmm. um, I was in a room with John Guthrie, Steve Bond, and Tom Leonard, and between the four of us, we worked on... Um, Street Wars and uh, oh god, how can I? Uh, no, Raven Home and um, the canals maps. Basically, <clears throat> I think John and I had a little bit of a rivalry going, um, right. which was similar to the thing that Milo and I had going because we were in the room, we were in each other's personal space. It was this tiny room with no windows and basically no air either. <laughs> <Right>. Um, <laughs> And I think in a situation like that, when you've, you've, you have a lot of pressure and you're, you're very close to one of the... Yes, I definitely had that rivalry, and that definitely helped, for sure. Uh -huh. um, I don't like working like that, because that kind of pressure... I mean, you don't really want to live life under that kind of pressure for too long. Um, but it definitely creates... law leads to good work, I think. Uh -huh. um, so that, yeah, that rivalry definitely, I think, pushes the bar... Um, but it's not essential. Right. I think for Milo and I, given the time that we had, um, he was a very inspirational person to work with, and I think I still think part of being on a big team with some incredibly talented people is it's more inspirational than rival. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. That, I mean, so that definitely has happened over the years. Mm, Same I, thing with TF2, I think, with multiplayer maps. Like, if somebody makes a map that I'm just like, wow, why didn't I think of that? Okay, I want to go do better. Yeah, well, I suppose there's that equivalency, right, of uh, having respect for the people you work with and, and wanting to match the quality of their work kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> were, you, were you aware of what Milo loves so much about remixing Entryway from Doom 2? He, he did a... <laughs> He's in the joke quite oh, a lot. Right. <laughs> the go to it map. Yeah. Was there a specific right. reason he sort of wanted to do that, do you recall? Um 
I'm trying to remember why. You know, it might have been. Uh, you know, I'd be speculating. My, my, I wouldn't. I don't know for sure, but my speculation would be uh, that map was made later in the process, and we were so exhausted with all of the maps that we built up to that point. I, I think oh, this is so speculative, though. Mm -hmm. I'd love to ask him this. I think it was later in the process, and maybe he liked the idea of taking. Well, there's got to be there's got to be a couple of reasons for doing this. One is kind of like it's a cool reveal of how this map is changing around you. You like it's familiar, and then it's unfamiliar, and then it's really unfamiliar, and then it's very hostile and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if it was founded in the fact that we had pretty much exhausted ourselves by that point. I don't know. I hate to say that because that sort of that almost demeans the uh, the map itself because I, I think the map is awesome. Yeah, me too. Um, uh, it was, it was, yeah, I, I wonder, I wonder about that. Um, I don't mm. actually know the answer, but yeah, I think I'll definitely ask me later now. now <laughs> I want to know. You could definitely look at it in sort of, you know, nuanced terms of like, it does seem to fit that whole design brief of like the ex, the player expectations of a Doom I would, and then kind of flipping them on their head and presenting new challenges and, and evolving and stuff for Plutonius style. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've, I'm in awe of that map. I thought it was just amazing, and that's what led to Punish, Punisher and Punish 2 and all that kind of stuff, because so I thought this is just this is the kind of map I want to play now. Right. Yeah, so that was, that was very cool. That was exactly one of those things that I was saying. Like, he would do these, he would do these amazing things that I would just think, okay, now I have to up my game and sometimes just sort of follow in his footsteps. Yeah, and... I've heard you talk, I think, um, in maybe multiple different interviews, actually, about how uh, you felt like Milo had, like, this elegant uh, aspect to his level design uh, during yeah, the returning all... process. Yeah. And, yeah, I guess the I was designs... curious what you think uh, sort of elegant level design entails, I suppose. Um, if you look at his maps from a top-down, so look at it on the auto map, they look very. They look like almost like fractal drawings or something, mm -hmm. in some cases. Or they just they just have this very clean but beautiful layout. Everything is all of the the way he managed to to keep a layout looking so nice uh, and elegant from the top, but all of the spaces are connected well and it plays well as well. This is something I was like, how do you do both of those things? I can figure out how I can figure out one of those things. But bringing those two things together is like that's just amazing to me. I don't know how he does it. Yeah. Um, and they're deceptively they look deceptively simple from the top down. Um, but the way the spaces are connected and the, and your path through the spaces means that it's actually quite a challenge to get through them, even though the maps are quite well, quite simple. Um, and I couple that with his use of lighting and texture. And like the consistency that he has and the themes that he comes up with, I was just always very, very impressed with that. I mean, he's an extremely artistic guy, um, and it showed, you know, when he was making his map. So I was, I was always taking inspiration for, for for the new directions that he was pushing these materials in, because a lot of times I would take inspiration from uh, existing Doom Two maps or things that I would see uh, outside of gaming in general, like in real world or something. Um, but he was able to draw inspiration from somewhere and create these things that were totally unique um, and I thought really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think I always felt that way about Plutonia. As as a kid, when I sort of first started making maps, I would go and look at your maps and uh, I would always think, like, oh, I could never make anything like this. Like, <laughs> they always just seemed, oh, like, way too complex at the time. Like, we're... I don't know, I guess it's difficult now for people probably who are using the newer tools uh, and stuff to appreciate, but uh, making maps in the old editors was difficult. Uh, it so. was. Everything Everything was dot to dot, basically. We had no tools, no geometric tools at all. We couldn't even draw a circle. Yeah. Um, it was just all join one dot to another. So if you, had a, if you wanted to make a circle, you have to go, okay, up two squares and then right to the write three or whatever, and then just continue this circle. It was ridiculous. Yeah, no 3D um, so mode, uh, importantly. 
if you wanted how to he was able to play the game. Uh, exactly. How he was able to draw those elegant shapes, that to me was just mind-blowing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess with Go To It, uh, you sort of said that I mean, the difficulty of it and, and the way it was structured was something that you wanted to see more of. And you, and you talked about how earlier, like, you guys had played Doom to Death and... Uh, like you wanted to see monster combinations you hadn't seen and you, you didn't want to see sort of stock standard placement and, and challenges and things like that. Uh, I was wondering now that you're playing sort of uh, newer content like uh, Sunlust and Sunder and things like that, which really is like birthed from that exact ethos of people who have played a lot of the game and and uh, want something more out of it, I suppose. Like, <laughs> does that give you some satisfaction that go to it? kind of was uh, the beginning for a lot of people of that. Um, that should definitely give Milo some satisfaction. <laughs> well, yeah, Milo as well, obviously. But, um, but you know, as the creators think, of Plutonia, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, if there's any if there's any connection whatsoever to the work we did back then to that stuff now, then I think that's incredibly flattering because um, Sunlust and Sunder and I guess Valiant is a slightly different kind of experience. But mm -hmm. they're just so amazing. They're so more ex for, so so much more extreme than I would ever have imagined you would have had a Doom experience. But also well polished and balanced and accessible. I just yeah I don't know how that was done. That just seems like an incredible amount of work, but in exactly the direction that I would have taken Doom. Mm -hmm. It's just like like. It, it, what what really amazes me is that they're using exactly the same elements that we used back then. Same monsters, exactly the same weapons. And creating these amazingly choreographed fight sequences. And they're so um, inventive still with the same elements. That's just, yeah, it blows my mind. Mm. Um, and they're, they're really fun. Really, really fun. I mean, extreme, like... Some sun uh, sunlust maps are insane, and I hate them because they're just impossible <laughs> to play. They, they require the kind of, kind of skill that I'll never have in my lifetime. And some of them, they they have these bites that are all about incredibly cramped quarters, and I, I just can't stand the really cramped quarters where there's very little margin for error because there's just too many random number generation code going on in that game for that to be really enjoyable for me. Um, but I would say a good 50% of each of those map packs are uh, just outstanding. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you should check out uh, Fractured Worlds. I've heard that's pretty good too. Fractured Worlds? Yeah, I made it. <laughs> yeah. like it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to write that down. Fractured yeah. Worlds. I'll look it up. It's in the same vein. It's uh, difficult. I'll say that much. But uh, How does I it compare to those two? Mm, I, I would, the aim was to be sort of like around the difficulty of like the later Sunlust maps, but some fights definitely spike to being uh, quite a bit harder. So it is quite difficult. Harder? Oh my god! Yeah, but it's it's shorter. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> you know, it's I think all up it's uh, eight or nine maps, something like that. So maybe a bit. I was very that. upset to see um this. This YouTuber called, uh, oh my god, how can I forget him now? He was, he's like one of the big, best Doom players, or most notorious Doom players, or famous Doom players ever. Is it Sino? Um, not Decino. Um, oh, Zero Master, maybe? Yes, yeah, Zero yeah. Master. I watched him play through a Slaughter Ward, but it was a tools-assisted run where uh -huh. you have all this magic going on. I was like, how is he avoiding all of that damage? And it turns out, oh, you know, he's playing at eighth speed or whatever, and he's every time he gets damage, he rewinds until he can dodge the five. I was like, wow, this is getting to a point where I don't really like watching this now because it's not a real performance. It's like a, a robot performance, almost like um, too many hacks, you know. Um, well, but then I watched some of his videos that weren't tools assisted, and he's an awesome player. He's about as good as the robot, <laughs> to be honest. Zero Master. Yeah, yeah, which is fantastic. I just didn't like discovering that there was this thing called a tools-assisted run 
Uh, that made it look like you are so much better than you actually are. Well, it's very common in speedrunning. I'm not sure how many sort of other speedrun games you've watched, but uh, they usually will have like a tool assisted category. And I think speedrunners usually use it as a way to be like, okay, what's like the absolute best possible time you could get uh, for this? And then they right. work from what the, the task bot can do backwards and then figure out new strats from that kind of thing. And then I watched him speed run through Plutonia and then I was getting really upset because he was doing these exploits of like squeezing through areas he wasn't supposed to squeeze through and stuff. And I just <laughs> yeah. thought, nah, I don't know. I don't know if that's... I mean, I guess that technically there's an achievement because you, you know, you're figuring out how to do all of these exploits and stuff. Um, and you can technically get the fastest time, but I don't know. I felt a bit grubby when I was watching it's him do It's brutal that. to watch your maps. Uh, <laughs> especially these days now, like, because I know about all this stuff, so... Things like glides, for instance, are one of the most common ones, uh, where it, if the gap is 32 wide, then the player is sort of the exact uh, width, mm -hmm. and he can get through it by sort of finagling, by pushing his way through very slowly. But, um, you know, you leave one of those gaps in as someone who knows about it, and you see someone do it, and you're like, oh, God, how could I possibly have forgotten? <laughs> yeah. It's painful. Well, I do. I'm a big fan of Decino because he seems like he's kind of just very genuine, like he's playing without any assistance. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but it seems like. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, yeah, I don't think he's uh, <laughs> secretly using any task tools or anything, but um, there, there are quite a lot of people. A lot of, I mean, Zero Master is a good example of someone who is just insanely good at the game. Probably one of the best. Uh, mm -hmm. But he, I think he just does task stuff for fun, just to see what he can kind of push the game to do. All right. So, uh, moving on to Valve and, and Half-Life, uh, I was curious sort of what it was like moving from, you know, this two-person sort of, you know, community-driven project essentially to begin with, and then you move into a full studio with, uh, you know, other game designers and, and a big company and everything. What was that transition like? Uh, initially, really exciting, because... I wanted to, I never liked working alone, um, so I was really, really excited to be working with some like-minded people, um, and pretty much everybody. I think when I was hired at Valve, I was the only person who had shipped a product, I believe. Wow. And then after me, Chuck Jones arrived from 3D Realms, and he had shipped um, Duke Nukem, um, and I think a couple other people arrived after me who had shipped something. But yeah, at that point, it was it was a very, very... It was we were amateurs basically, mm -hmm. um, but we all just shared shared this passion for making awesome games, and so it was really really exciting. And then it became really difficult because, on the back of the fact that none of us or very few of us had shipped anything before, we were all just getting to know each other, um, and getting to know each other at the same time as trying to make a game that didn't didn't really have a precedent. Um, because we were trying to do a lot of new things with Half Life, it was all—it was incredibly scary, yeah. and it was—it was brutal being in a place where your work was up in your playtesting in Valve or at, at Valve in the early days was was very brutal. It was like no no prisoners taken. It was like yeah, the, these these levels suck. You have to uh, go and redo them or something like that. Oh, right. Um, so it was it was very sink or swim. Um, it was also difficult for me to go from Doom to, or Doom and Quake, because I've been working on Quake as well, to mm -hmm. something that was more puzzle-oriented, narrative-oriented, um, almost sort of realistic-based. Uh, that that was a that was a real challenge to shift uh, yeah. from one paradigm to another, because you know Doom is so abstract and sort of build whatever gameplay requires and then Half-Life is suddenly, oh no, this is set in offices and this is set in <laughs> research labs and caves and stuff it's like, ah, oh, really? That doesn't sound much fun to design for. <laughs> yeah, these are all things I definitely wanted to touch on. Uh, <laughs> basically all these things well, you mentioned. Very difficult and it's also coupled with personal difficulties of being 
you know, being in a, in a new country, surrounded by people I'd never met before, and having absolutely nothing whatsoever to focus on other than work, 18 yeah. hours a day, seven days a week for 18 months. Um, so it was very, very high pressure. Yeah, um, very yeah, interesting days back in the early days of Valve. Um, it was uh, it was sometimes awesome, sometimes ugly. <laughs> right, of course. I think I heard you talk about how you sort of also you just sort of jumped into making levels for Half Life almost immediately. Uh, so what were you working with at that point in terms of like like assets and and the engine and things like that when you were sort of originally making maps uh there was like uh because i had i was hired in november 96 and i had to wait for my visa to come through so i didn't move there until may 97 okay um at that point we did have basic material set and sort of a basic understanding of the settings of the maps we were working on so the very first thing i did was um I built some train tunnels in the uh, power-up section of Half-Life, which ended up making it into the game, oddly enough. Wow. Because um, there was so much scrapped stuff in that, in that project. But uh, this particular map that I started working on um, ended up shipping. Um, but it was just train tunnels, basically. And we had train rail textures, if you could call them that, um, <laughs> and some basic concretes and sort of... I didn't really know what was going to happen in the map. I knew that somebody told me that there was going to be this big monster sort of stomping around the tunnels and some soldiers and right. you know you were going to be fighting against soldiers and this big monster so I was like I guess I'll just build whatever comes to mind so was the um, story already all there like you already had like the full oh no 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 no, no not okay. at all okay um Mark Laidlaw wasn't hired till I think um I think he might have already been hired he just didn't arrive until a couple of weeks after I did maybe a month after I did um, so we didn't really have, we had the foundations of a story, but it was so basic and it changed pretty much fundamentally. Right. Um, so no, we, we, we just had this understanding of there is this experiment that goes wrong. It's in the desert, um, opens up a portal to hell. <laughs> this is just like a retelling of the doom story, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we had some different ideas for how we wanted the game to be, you know, a lot more thought uh, thought involved, you know, like puzzles and <clears throat> Mario elements of platforming and stuff, which mm. unfortunately I build a lot of. I hate platforming. <laughs> That's interesting. But uh, I inherited the residue processing. Well, I didn't inherit. Um, I was given the residue processing um, chapter of Half-Life, which Gabe was just always on my ass about. <laughs> You've got to, this has to be, well, Gabe and Mike both, Mike Harrington was the co-founder, saying this has to be better than Mario and GoldenEye 64, or, or GoldenEye, I think it was just, yeah. Um, so you got to have all kinds of jumping puzzles and pistons crushing you and um, uh, what are these things? Conveyor belts all over the place, you know, just like multi multiple layers of conveyor belts you have to jump on and jump off at the right time and all this stuff. And I was going, ah, oh, but I like, I like Doom, you know, I like running around <laughs> shooting monsters and <laughs> yeah. so that was that was a challenge to adapt from just like the high intensity action sequences to the jumping around navigation sequences, um, which you know, it's always fun to have challenges like that as a game designer and see you know, experiment with different styles of gameplay. Um, yeah. It's just, you know, it takes a little bit of adjusting your mind to. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting you mentioned GoldenEye 64 because I, I think I'd always wonder with Half-Life what games you looked at if it had been mainly sort of PC-based stuff like Quake and Doom or if, uh, if you were looking at uh, GoldenEye and I don't think Perfect Dark would have been out yet. But uh, yeah, I had wondered. No. Yeah, about those. Uh, we were, yeah, we definitely looked at GoldenEye. We were really worried about Sin and Daikatana. <laughs> we and didn't have to be worried about Daikatana. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, at the time, the press was real, right? The press about all of those games was real, and yeah. we had to take them as a credible threat. So we wanted to make sure that we had the technology that they had, and we had you know, like a, a better gameplay experience than they had. Um, and that was our motivation. That was our competition at the time. So 
it was always a matter of look if if golden eyes done this better than us we failed if uh, yeah. sin you know if they've managed to do <laughs> i mean it was ridiculous back then we were talking about transparent textures and blood splats and stuff like it's just the most basic features you've you take for granted these days but you know back then it was like oh we have to have blood splats and we have to have rails that you can shoot through and stuff um yeah that was kind of bizarre thinking back to it actually well yeah i mean engine limitations were real back then like uh i even the fact that i mean one of the things that's great about doom is I always felt like the monsters felt like they inhabited the space very realistically. Even though they're sprites, they have a lot of rotation, so they feel very solid compared to a lot of games mm -hmm. at the time, like Duke and stuff. And and they're also like their corpses stay on the ground, which was very rare uh, for games back then. I know I I much preferred the Doom monsters to the first couple of generations of well probably all of the quake monsters after that but the uh, yeah. the polygonal monsters that showed up in quake i thought wow they're just they don't have the character that the doom monsters had i think the doom monsters were they were absolutely nailed um whoever was working on that nailed those monsters i like, couldn't have done any better in my opinion yeah uh incredible sandbox just in general really weapons and monsters i think for doom uh, really yeah. probably one of the major reasons for its longevity i think uh, sure. So Gabe, uh, Gabe Newell was tangentially related to Ian and Doom because he worked on the Windows 95 port of the game. Uh, was he aware of your work specifically when you were hired? Like, uh, is that yes, yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, uh, yes, when initially when we started talking, they they knew about Final Doom, and um, I showed them what I was working on for Quake, and I was saying, "Hey, I'm working. I was work I was working on a game for Quake um, when I started talking to Valve, and I yeah. just said, hey, this is what I'm working on, and this is what I shipped in, in Final Doom.' Um, yeah, that, that was part of the conversations we were having. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you sort of touched on this very briefly, but w what were some of the challenges for you integrating story and and gameplay with Half Life? Uh, because obviously you hadn't really had to do that <laughs> uh, with Plutonia and stuff before, so were there difficulties structuring progression around story and things like that for you? Um, you know, it wasn't that difficult. The, the biggest, the biggest challenge I felt was with a story that was evolving or wasn't complete, and you kind of have to adapt as we as we went as the story changed. Right. Um, having a story gives you constraints which is sometimes really useful because without constraints your design can feel directionless or it can feel like I don't know I could do pretty much do anything that I want and that's really difficult to decide what do you, how are you going to choose one out of inf infinity it's really difficult if you're given those constraints and you're saying hey look the story takes us for example when we were working on Ravenholm um, that geometry had been built already for the, for the game there was no story element to it, really. I mean, there was a, there was a vague one, but not really. Um, but as soon as we were given this, this nugget of, okay, this is where the physics gun is going to be introduced, and this is, you know, there's this mad old um, pastor there who all of his flock has been turned into zombies because those combine canisters had been raining down head crabs to them. We thought, okay, yeah. now we have all of this structure that we didn't have before. And we can concentrate on the moment-to-moment -moment experience and the um, setting and the atmosphere and all of that stuff, which is really, really valuable to work on because you're given constraints of the story. Um, I think it makes the, your job much easier. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, and, and also, we're talking about Doom maps versus Half-Life maps. Doom maps were extremely simple and they had no relation to the one the map before it or after it whereas half-life was a continuous playthrough everything had to have some kind of connection to the map before or after or the story before or after so yeah very different problem set yeah and i suppose you would also be building you'd be building spaces that were supposed to be part of a larger whole i suppose whereas uh, you know they're meant to be part of a city or you know whatever the case may be uh, whereas with doom <laughs> each map can be kind of individually constructed without necessarily thinking about how does this fit into 
the larger narrative or whatever. Exactly, yeah. And that can be a blessing and a curse because you can you can make a Doom map. You can wake up and think of a cool idea for a Doom map and have it done you know, in a couple of days or just a day in some cases, maybe a week. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no... It's not reliant upon anything else. It can just stand or fall based on its own merits. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm I'm definitely curious about sort of people who began with maybe more simple level design structures and things, and then now you're working on games where much larger teams, uh, much more complex things, higher expectations for what should be in a game, and obviously, like, more complex engines and things like that. Is there, like, any sense of, like... Uh, do you ever miss being as light on your feet as you were <laughs> when you were making Doom maps without having to go through, like, a big checklist of things? Um, yep, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, Half-Life Alex was probably the extreme case of that. Yeah. Um, just because there are so many elements that go into it, you don't you don't have the ability to create a Half Life Alex map um, in anything less than months and months and months with input from dozens of people. Yeah. And so you absolutely lose that um, that ability to pivot in any direction as quickly as you want to go because. There's so much going into this map that pretty much things have to freeze. You have to have a lot of confidence in the design early on because a lot of stuff is not that flexible. And to get to the final result requires a lot of work by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And they all have to be coordinated. They all have to know what each other's doing. Otherwise, you lose work. And so I definitely miss that. Um, I recaptured some of that in TF2 um, because that was a product where it was easier to work, at least some of the maps, was it, they were easier to work in smaller groups, much smaller groups. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, the narrative, the single-player narrative-driven maps, yeah, they're becoming more and more complicated and very, very, very distant <laughs> yeah. from uh, the Doom days, for sure. Yeah. And you did I say... Do, I, mean, I definitely miss the Doom days, yeah, making your own thing. Mm -hmm. And you, you did say uh, <laughs> it was sort of it was a challenge having to make like office spaces and uh, and things like that. And uh, did you sort of miss I remember writing abstract in... spaces? Yeah, definitely. Um, to begin with, I think I think when I was emailing uh, Ted Backman, who I had contacted initially at, at Valve. I think I had said something, and this is before I knew we were going to make office levels. I think I said something like, you know, the, the, my biggest thing is that I like to work on imaginative um, apps and scenarios and stuff, and I, I, would, I would hate to work on, say, office levels. <laughs> <laughs> because they're just so damn boring. And, you know, the funniest thing is uh, I ended up working on office levels in Half-Life. And now I've just been playing through office levels in TNT Evolution. And so I think I know where that comment came from. Well, yeah, I was absolutely thinking uh, when you were talking about <laughs> not wanting to make office levels, was like, well, this must have come from his time like working with TNT stuff. because Yeah, because there are bizarre office levels with giant chairs and cube computers. And it's just like, I, would, I just hated that kind of stuff. I never tried to do that. Obviously, the fidelity of modern games you can make whatever you want mm -hmm. um, but back then you couldn't and i just could not understand why people wanted to do that yeah you just like your imagination is the limit um why would you be doing that kind of stuff so uh, this is why i have such a hard time <laughs> seeing that stuff in doom well there was a bit of an awkward period kind of post doom i went like nintendo 64 era and a little bit after it i think where there was like this <laughs> this push for like realism, but everything was still cubes. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. and it never really worked that well. No, no. Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I would say <clears throat> actually, when uh, talking about Goldeneye, that did a pretty decent job of emulating sort of realistic spaces, actually. Compared yeah, to I a agree lot with of that. Shooters, yeah. And you know, what? I I understand the temptation too because I'm pretty sure one of the very first things I did. Doom was to try to recreate my 
bedroom or my house or something. Yeah, my house it's, dot what? It's a very I mean, common. <laughs> exactly, and you know what? To this day, I think that's awesome. Except now, I do it in virtual reality, and wow. it actually looks like my house. Um, but I, so I, I get the temptation. Totally. That's a big flex. <laughs> right there. Well, the house I'm sitting in right now, um, I built. I. I bought the house when it was just started construction, and so I built the whole thing inside Hammer, uh, put it in virtual reality when I was working on Half-Life Alex. Was that beforehand? No, it was when I was working on Half-Life Alex. Yeah, on the weekends, I would uh, come in, and I'd put, put on the headset, and I'd be walking around my house. Okay, I need to move this wall here. I need to move this <laughs> out here. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and then I would send the plans to the architect um, or the builder. And then we would modify them and build a house. So I'm, I'm sitting in this house where I designed partly, at least through uh, virtual reality, and it's awesome. That it's is awesome really technology. cool. Yeah, that is really cool. Uh, absolutely the future. I can't believe this is not just the way people design 3D spaces, like 3D, uh, especially homes. Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, it's fantastic technology. Well, I, yeah, I definitely want to talk a little bit about, uh, about VR later on. Um, so, just sort of back to Half-Life, it was built on a heavily modified version of the Quake engine, uh, and I, I guess you said it was sort of already pretty much, like, fully built when you got there, the engine, or, or no? Um, definitely not. Uh, I think they were just working on colored lighting when I got there. Oh, okay. You just... Um, and we had to add, no, we added a ton. I mean, the, the, the engine team was working until the last day, okay. pretty much. <laughs> Do you know sort of the what the feet. goals were for, like, the engine's capabilities, like, versus Quake? Like, what were you trying to do better than, than Quake, I suppose? Um, well, we were just trying to adapt the engine to the game we were trying to make. So we knew we were making a game that was more realistic, so we wanted the light bouncing and mixing to be to be really good, like to get us to as close as we could as simulating daylight and stuff. Um, the engine, I mean, we also knew that we wanted to build characters who animated far more flexibly and convincingly, so we did the entire skeletal animation system. Um, we just had systems like that where we wanted to innovate simply because there was a goal of the product that needed to be met. Um, the AI, I guess the AI isn't really the engine, so to speak, but it's definitely part of the game. Um, mm -hmm. And we didn't want to have that sort of extremely fundamentally basic AI where the, the, the enemy would come at you um, without thinking. Right. So a lot of the, uh, the innovation on the engine side and the gameplay code side was driven by, well, we're not happy with, we're not satisfied with the, the state of the engine as far as this feature goes, so we're going to try to push it in this direction. Like We're going to try to push the behavior of the monsters in this direction, the animation, the lighting, um, the engine limits, um, stuff like that. Uh, so that, that's pretty much what drove the uh, tech innovation for Half-Life. Mm -hmm. It must have been difficult designing things with sort of an evolving engine, I would have thought, especially like you're talking about uh, AI as well, I would think designing sort of encounters and, and things would be kind of tricky when you don't know how the enemies are going to behave and, and stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's why a lot of content was thrown away for Half-Life. Um, right. We would make... We would build track with certain assumptions of features we were going to get or creatures that we had, and then those assumptions would be challenged or changed, and we'd have to either adapt what we have or we'd have to throw away a lot of it and then re rebuild it. Um, so there was a lot of that going on, um, a lot of unused or discarded track from Half-Life 1. Um, but as soon as, you know, that, this is why we were trying to solidify a lot of the, the tech as fast as we could, like get that AI working um, as well, at least well enough that it wasn't going to change substantially um, after we've started building track for it. Yeah. Uh so you, you've talked about how there was sort of a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor for Half-Life. When Half-Life 2 came around, uh, was was a lot of that... Uh, I mean, was it all basically to have, like, 
the story moving forward and have a true sequel or, or was uh, was part of it also. We have all this stuff uh, left over from Half-Life and we have this stuff we wanted to do for Half-Life that we couldn't put into the game. Uh, was was that part of the reason for the sequel as well? Um, to my knowledge, that second thing was not the case, no. I don't okay. think there were things lying around that we wanted to do but couldn't, but didn't have enough time or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was personally completely drained and exhausted by Half-Life 1. Um, I gave my, my very last breath to that project, so <laughs> I was not sitting around thinking, I cannot wait to start to put in all of the things that I couldn't put into Half-Life 1. <laughs> there may well have been some people at Valve thinking that, but um, I don't know. I think my... Yeah, I think it was far more likely that... I mean, after... It was far more likely that people were thinking the same, along the same lines that I was, which was... Thank God that's over. Um, <laughs> right. you know, we went to... We all went to Mexico after the, the, the game went gold. Um, and there was a lot of drinking involved. Um, Happy of, drinking, I hope, rather than... Uh, than yes, a lot of... Uh, it's like, okay, finally we can exhale after that incredibly exhausting journey. Um, I think Half-Life 2, when we, when we saw how well-received the first game was, we were just like, okay, so we're, now we have to step up our game in every way we possibly can. It's like, let's just start thinking about what that means. Um, mm -hmm. And... You know, that's its its own journey. That was six years of... I can't believe that Half-Life 1 was less than two years and Half-Life 2 was six. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I was actually going to note that um, I saw an interview with Gabe Newell where he's like quoted as saying that he basically gave the team like an unlimited budget and an unlimited amount of time for Half-Life 2 to make sure that I think he said it was like the best FPS of all time. Uh, and I guess... Uh. Um, well, thank God he didn't tell us that because that would have been too much pressure. <laughs> well, yeah, I was gonna say, uh, you know, what was it like having like so much freedom to develop a game, and what was the pressure like after the, like the success of the first game uh, for Half Life Two? I, you know, I didn't really feel that much pressure at all. Um, okay. I felt confident that we could use the cool innovations that were coming up, and this sort of desire to push things forward. I, I, I was always extremely confident about, uh, about Half-Life 2. Um, I mean, I was, I, I was a lot more confident than I was with Half-Life 1 because we'd already created this thing, and now we were just building on top of this thing that we'd created, um, but with a lot more time, um, and, and we've, we had had a little time to decompress between the two projects. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I did not personally feel... Um, that was going to be sorry i didn't feel that that was going to be an issue right so half-life 2 was uh, a bit more of an enjoyable process than overall um yes for me for sure yeah, yeah. um it was really drawn out well yeah i i likened this is kind of ridiculous in retrospect but i likened um finishing half-life one Oh, I had two analogies for it. One was giving birth, because I have no idea what giving birth is like, but I've heard it's very difficult. I thought, like, that's, that's, what, that's what that's like. That's what that must feel like, giving birth. But the other one was um, Half-Life 1 was to me like, because I'd never shipped anything of that um, complexity before. Uh, I likened it to climbing a mountain where, because the mountain is jagged and you're at the foot of it, you can never really see the true top of the mountain. And you get up to this peak and you think, oh, I'm there, I'm at the summit. And then you come over the peak and you realize, oh shit, there's another yeah. uh, another section of this mountain that I couldn't see from the bottom. And you get to the top of that one and then you just basically keep doing that. Eventually you get to the top, but you have all of these false summits. And that's what Half-Life 1 felt to me was... I think we're in the home stretch. Oh, hang on, no, no, we're not. We're still a long way away from the home stretch. Um, and I kept getting fooled by that over and over. When we finally shipped the product, I was like, okay, so that's what it takes to put a really good product out. And I'm going into Half-Life 1 knowing that and expecting that and knowing what it looks like to have a product that 
it's looking good, but it is a long way from being what we would consider good enough to ship as Half-Life 2. So I never really experienced those false summits because those are really, yeah. um, those are they're, they're sort of a shattering to to realize. Oh, okay, I just saved up all of my energy for that last push. Oh, by the way, <laughs> the next push starts tomorrow morning, and it's yeah. going to be just as bad. And it's like, oh god, I can't. Yeah, you you have to pace yourself, and you have to understand the amount of energy that it takes to ship the game. Mm -hmm. And not just sort of run out of energy a fifth of the way through. Yeah. So Half Life Two was a lot easier for me personally, even though it was incredibly challenging for so many reasons and for so much time. Mm -hmm. It was a different type of mental exhaustion. It wasn't like this complete physical and mental exhaustion that Half Life One was. Yeah, I suppose in terms of specific challenges, I was wondering what it was like, sort of constructing like the physics puzzles and and designing maps around those puzzle elements was there like was there like a bit of pressure to utilize like the new tech as much as possible for instance like uh, as a level designer definitely yep um physics were a big part of Half life 2 obviously and this was me in the room with john guthrie again like he would come up with these ridiculous cool uses of physics and i go ah oh, crap now i have to <laughs> now i have to do that um, right. And so, yeah, having having somebody to kind of uh, yeah, having somebody in the room who was really good at that stuff um, was really helpful. And yeah, as soon as Jay Stelly put some new physics um, feature into the engine, we would want him to be most proud of us for using. <laughs> I wanted to go to Jay and say, "Check this out! I've just used your feature. You're going to be really happy you programmed this feature now because look at what I've done with it." Um, that gave me a lot of pride where the same thing with the AI that Steve Bond was writing. I wanted him to play through something that I had made and feel really good about his AI. His AI. Same thing when Jay would put some physics feature in. I want him to, to play this game and realize, yeah, my, my work is, <laughs> is worth it. You know? Um, so there was there was some pressure there, but there was also it was it was re really rewarding. Mm -hmm. Definitely, like it sounds a bit like a John Carmack uh, with the rest of it kind of uh, dynamic, where he would he'd be like, "Well, I got this new lighting engine, guys. Make some skyboxes and stuff." Yeah, right. Make me proud. But yeah. Uh, so I suppose without going into like too many details, obviously, I was wondering. Like, how often did the idea of Half-Life 3, like, seriously come up over the years before before Alex was decided on? Without going into too many details? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know it's, like, always been, um, like, this dumb question that gets asked in interviews, like, for a well, long time about, about Half-Life. Yeah, uh, it's, but... it's, it's not dumb because it's, it's an obvious question, of course. Yeah. Um, because we never, we never made it um, up to this point. Um, but it was always in the back of our minds, of course. But what happened with Valve after Half-Life 2 was that Steam was becoming, coming into its own. Counter-Strike was happening, and, and, and um, Team Fortress was happening, and this whole multiplayer shift was happening in the company where we thought, this is a really interesting space we want to um, explore. At the same time as Gabe deciding we were going to do... Uh, uh, what's it called? Um, episodic content. Right. We're not going to make Half-Life 3 because we've just been through six years of making Half-Life 2. And I don't think there was anybody in the company who would have said yes to starting work on Half-Life 3 right after that because yeah. it was brutal. It was a, a lot of very brutal work. So um, I think it was a lot more palatable for everybody to start putting out episodic work. We didn't want to make the community wait for another six years before they saw any more Half-Life content. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, okay, you know, we don't want to work on Half-Life 3. We want to make episode 1, 2, and 3, and then maybe we'll... that's as if we had done Half-Life 3, but you would see Half-Life content way more frequently. Right, yeah. Um, so we, at that point, I don't think people were thinking about Half-Life 3. They were thinking about delivering more content in a different way. And obviously with episode two, we just, we realized that 
it wasn't easy for us to make that shift to well we're going to just push out small like smaller chunks of content more frequently because we just ended up doing the thing we always do at valve which is well we could make this a little better and we could make this a little better and like yeah, this needs to be filled out a little bit and you know this is such a good idea we need to exploit this more and before you know it your your episode that's supposed to be designed in a year is now like an eight to nine hour experience <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. oh well this is not working too well. So I think after the ep after episode two shipped, that was the uh, orange box, and we had Team Fortress Two, which was just this incredibly popular IP internally that people really wanted to work on, and just things were shifting within Valve away from the standard uh, gargantuan, like monolithic product that sort of comes out once every six years to. Hey, we can iterate on this multiplayer product and keep keep a large audience of players engaged on a regular basis. Let's see where this goes. You know, how 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 is this yeah. going to do? Um, and the Half Life Three thing was like further and further into the rearview mirror. Not really sure how this was going to be part of our strategy moving forward. So it just sort of receded for a while. Um, and then, of course, because of um, virtual reality and uh, all that kind of stuff, it came back into the fo focus again. And it just was the best um, concept for doing a uh, VR game. Yeah. From our IP, anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear that, uh, you know, the attempts to change up the development cycle and stuff at Valve over the years and shifting in priorities. It didn't and <laughs> It was a good idea, but it didn't. Uh, we didn't execute it too well. Well, yeah. I mean, it must be difficult to, uh, I don't know, deal with the expectations of your audience and and try and guess what they're uh, gonna be okay with or excited about. Because uh, I mean, you know, technically, you released all this content that uh, was like it was quite a lot of content for Half Life Two, and uh, you know. But people were still like, "Well, where's the third one?" <laughs> After all of that, which must have been a bit frustrating. Episode three or Half Life three? Because uh, I mean, I've been asked questions about both. You know, there was EP three. Because look at that, look at that cliffhanger that episode two ended on. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, I mean, episode. I mean, episode three was was being worked on before we shipped episode two. So there was that project there. It just it got uh, usurped by other products at the company. Right. Okay. Uh, well, you talked about this shift to like a multiplayer focus and 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 things of Valve. Was that where Left 4 Dead sort of spawned from? Um, Left 4 Dead came from um, a a Counter Strike mod that Turtle Rock was working on. Right. Um, yes, that would have been. That would have been really, yeah, that very soon after um, Orange Box. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw a lot of promise in that game, and we thought, you know, this is sort of out of left field. Let's go, let's take a look at this for a while. Um, and then Left 4 Dead 2 straight after that. Yeah, and how different was it? I mean, you heard obviously, I mean, you and Milo back way back we're obviously making your own deathmatch things and multiplayer had obviously always been like a bit of a focus for you level design wise but uh was it quite different jumping in from doing quite story driven stuff and then uh was it nice to come back to like combat driven progression i guess i loved it yeah, yeah. i've always preferred multiplayer to single player always um i've, I've always had much more fun designing multiplayer and uh, single player, right. so I was I was all about that. I, I jumped on TF. I, I loved TFC. Absolutely adored TFC. T T Team Fortress Classic. Uh, I built Dust Bowl and quite a few other maps in that. Right. Um, I was obsessed with it. Uh, and then as soon as Orange Box came out, because I was working on Episode Two, I just jumped straight onto TF2 because I loved the TF franchise and uh, built Gold Rush for TF2. Mm -hmm. um, and I kept coming back to TF2 over the years, and then 
um, Left 4 Dead, Left 4 Dead 2 as well. Just, yeah, just absolutely love multiplayer. I love this idea that you're playing with other people. It just feels like just a much more, much richer um, experience when you're sharing it with other people, I feel like. Um, single player is really, really fun, but it's a very solitary box. It was. I mean, now I guess you can play through on Twitch, and it's not a solitary experience yeah. at all. Um, but I'd still argue that playing single player on Twitch and interacting with other people is kind of like the same as multiplayer, um, except you just don't have other people in the game with you. Um, but yeah, I've always loved multiplayer, and I was really, really excited to get back to it after finishing episode two. Mm -hmm. well, that said, Portal 2 was, I think, my favorite project in the last, well, the last 12 years or so, because that's just unbelievably fun to work on. That, that right. IP is just absolute magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I did want to talk about Portal 2 briefly as well, uh, but I, I, I guess I was wondering if there was a bit of a challenge with Left 4 Dead 2 in terms of uh, keeping like the gameplay flow feeling interesting when you were building maps for it, because obviously uh, the maps are like very linear by nature. Uh, were there any struggles there, or did you have like quite fixed yes. ideas of how to do it? Uh, no, I was very worried about that. Um, on Left 4 Dead 1, I just played a technical role. Left 4 Dead 2, I actually built content for, and I was, right. when I started that project, I was genuinely at a loss for understanding how to build fun content for Left 4 Dead because it was, it's basically the director, right? And the director does what the director wants to do. And you're building a playground for the director to operate in, essentially. And I was just like, how do you how do we vary this? Like, how do we build something that we haven't seen before? And how do we, how, how do we get to peak Left 4 Dead? Um, like, what, what is the most, what is the kind of Left 4 Dead experience that you really want to have? Okay, so build a map that does that. And I was like, I don't really know. I don't know how to do this because the director is the same in every map. He's doing the same things and you just have to build a sort of a different playground. So yeah. I think that was a really interesting challenge. Um, and it really came down to are you building for co-op, are you building for versus and you have to have things for both the map and what's the funnest part of co-op and what is the funnest part of versus mm -hmm. and then just try to get those things happening and so I just played a lot and I thought okay I'm going to write down all the things that I think are awesome about this game um, and then I'm going to try to get those things happening. So, yeah, it was definitely a different, but an extremely different product to work on. Um, but ultimately, so much fun to work on that because yeah. it's like 75% playtesting, which, I mean, <laughs> yeah. who doesn't love playtesting Left 4 Dead for, for a living? I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, it does seem like the development would have been pretty streamlined in a lot of ways because... Uh, you know, the maps are fairly linear in their structure, and then also uh, there's no, like, strict, you know, uh, thing or, like, monster placement or, or whatever. It's all done in these waves, and then there's a random element to the waves as well, so... Uh, which might have made things more difficult, I, I suppose, but um, I could imagine... It was a lot easier, yeah. A lot easier to playtest. Yeah. A lot easier, because, like you say, there's no... Uh, linear narrative. There are no triggers. There's no. There's no. There's, there isn't this incredibly complicated set of timing, arithmetic entities that go into making a very precise um, e uh, experience. This is all run by the director, so it was much easier to play test. I think the very reason why it was harder to get my brain around designing for this game was also the reason why it was easy to play test. Um, so much, much easier to build a Left 4 Dead map than anything to do with Left 4 Dead. Uh, sorry, for Half-Life or Portal. Yeah. Or even TF2 for that matter, because TF2 you have to consider nine different classes with everything that you build, as well as all of the goal items and stuff. But Left 4 Dead, yeah, it was... Uh, yeah. I think when you look at the ratio of the f fun to build versus challenging and difficult time to ship, like that was like seventy five percent fun, twenty five percent difficult. Whereas mm -hmm. before, everything else is like ninety five percent difficult and five percent fun to build. Right. Yeah. 
Well, I suppose with TF2 you have the added problem of, you know, that dirty word balancing uh, because it's PvP, so... Uh, oh yeah, we all hate that word. Yeah, like... Also, Sims, the dirtiest yeah, word in TF2 is sniper. <laughs> right. You basically, you build, you build the map that you want to build because you think it's fun and all of the uh, classes are having an awesome time and then one sniper shows up and he just destroys the entire... Like, everybody's day is now ruined. And you think, well, now I have to completely change this entire map because the sniper is going to ruin everything. So I'm going to put fences <laughs> up. I'm going to shrink the size of everything. I'm going to take all of the sight lines out. And it's like, huh. Oh. Yeah, the sniper was the biggest challenge for any TF2 mapper, I think. Yeah. Uh, funnily enough, when I was looking for like interviews for, for research and stuff, seeing what you'd sort of said about previous games, there was some video <laughs> some guy had posted. Uh, I think it was like last year or something, and he'd gotten banned from a TF2 server, and he was claiming that you had personally uh, banned him <laughs> from the server uh, because he was just too good. Like, I think he was pay right. playing Sniper, and uh, that was his claim to fame. Yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> well, we, yeah, don't, we, don't, we don't get to do that. Uh, that sounded pretty hilarious, but... You know. Uh, I was I'm almost sure hoping was, it was true. It was very good. Uh, <laughs> so I was I was thinking sort of Left 4 Dead 2 had like some parallels with Doom 2 in terms of being like similar to the first game uh, same engine I believe and uh, just new maps new monsters things like that I was wondering because DLC was like such a huge thing at the time was there ever a point where it was like uh, Left 4 Dead 2 was considered as DLC for Left 4 Dead 1 and then it expanded into like a, a full sequel or was it always sort of going to be uh, a sequel from the start. It was always going to be a sequel. Right. Um, we wanted to we wanted to have an aggressive release date because Left 4 Dead 2 was hot, and we had some ideas for how to what, what to add to the game, and we just wanted it to come out while the original game was still building uh, momentum. Right. Um, so yeah, it was never it was never conceived as DLC. It was always going to be a standalone thing because, yeah, we wanted to change enough of it that uh, it couldn't be layered on top of the original game. It had to be its own thing, mm -hmm. okay. which I guess was controversial at the time because of the time compression between the two. Right. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, I think people like looked at the the release time and stuff and. And, uh, Which is ironic when you think about how long, like, people complain if it takes you too long to bring out <laughs> yeah. people, but then they'll complain if it takes too quickly as well. Um, but I, I mean, think we're long past that at this point. I mean, how many games come out with sequels in a year or two? Like, it's just, it's incredibly common. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, I'm quite excited now to get to Portal 2, uh, because you said how much you, you loved uh, working on it. What, what sort of capacity did you work on um, Portal 2? In? Um, I worked on the, the chapter called The Fall, I think it was, which is all of the, like the historic part of Portal 2, where basically you're falling down that endless uh, chimney thingy with... Gladys just as she'd been turned into a potato. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so you're going through the you know the behind the scenes stuff, and you're finding out um, what uh, aperture science was like in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I worked on that entire thing, and that was just a blast to work on because Eric Woolpore and Jay Pinkinson are just absolute genius comedy writers, and mm -hmm. there's just never a more fun meeting to be in. Than when those guys are in there, because I mean their their writing is so amazingly funny, but they are like that all the time in life. It's just impossible. I don't know how they do it, but they're always just entertaining. Doesn't matter if you're working. Doesn't matter if you're just chatting about nothing and anything. They're just so much fun to be around, and that just makes such. I mean, their when their personality comes through into the product like that just makes it a joy to contribute to and work work with. Um, you add that to just the sheer genius of that idea, the mechanic of portals, and the fact that we managed to put this 
it's just this amazingly fitting narrative into it. Um, I don't know, to me, being asked to work on the sequel to Portal was just like being given a gift of just like, yeah, yeah you can't really ask for more than this. And it was so rewarding to build puzzles that use these, on the face of it, very simple mechanics, but you have to end up building a fairly complicated puzzle out of it. And that's just, to me, that's just one of the most rewarding things about game design is um, being able to have that kind of that golden tool set and using it to create uh, experiences that people enjoy. Um, I don't know. To me, that's like the height of single player um, design experience, I think, that I've, I've ever done at Valve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, truly like one of the most unique FPS titles to ever exist. I mean, if you can even call it an FPS, but uh, first person. Yeah, barely. Puzzle, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, you didn't work on, on the original Portal, so uh, as far as I could tell, anyway. Um, so no, I was working on Episode 2, because that came out in the orange box. Um, yeah. So yeah, I was working on Episode 2 at that time. So what was it like coming into Portal 2, and then... Uh, I'm assuming you'd played the first Portal, but I, I would guess you'd have to sort of familiarize yourself with the mechanisms like behind the game and, and how to utilize those uh, in level design. I had played uh, the original Portal playtesting um, Orange Box, yeah, so I knew how it worked. Um, it was, it took no time at all to come into the project, because I came onto that project after shipping, I think it was Man vs. Machine for PF2, I don't know if I got my timeline right, but I came on it like halfway into the project, so mm -hmm. there were already, we'd already had the paint added to the project, and right. we'd had you know, a few new elements that I wasn't um, familiar with. And also, this is like this is me going back to Ravenholm again, which is I was given this notion that okay, part, the part of game that I was going to be responsible for is you're you're you know you're with Gladys in a potato, and you're now exploring the old <clears throat> uh, Aperture Lab area, <clears throat> showcasing the history of this facility. And I'd seen the concepts, and I thought, wow, this is so, so interesting. And I love that this is all a freeform use of the portal gun, which was in, you know, in cages and test labs, basically, up to this point. But yeah. now you're using this thing to move around spaces. That just sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's, you don't have to use many. I mean, you've literally got the portal gun and the three types of um, paint. That's it. Those are your only mechanics. Um, and this, this, the fact that you can just make pretty much endless um, puzzles and track and unique ways of presenting the the 50s, 60s, and 70s versions of Aperture, I, I, just, I don't know, it just, it just seemed like this, this gift that um, I was given at the mm -hmm. time. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny, though, because I feel like that's the one section of the game that may actually have offices in it. That you would have had to build. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, you're right. Yes, I can't believe it. I think that's. I think you're getting pranked, maybe a little bit. That's right. But you know what? Uh, if I remember rightly, I think those offices may have been built. They were templated. I think. I think. Yes, Chris Chin, oh, okay. uh, a resident architect. I think he had templated these offices. So he created this um, this set. And thankfully, I only had to sort of copy paste it in yeah. particular arrays and arrangements in order to get it to work um right. thank goodness for that saved by <laughs> prefabs for making offices exactly <clears throat> uh so like what was the actual level design process like for making a portal 2 map was was the was the brunt of the work done through like planning and experimentation with like the physics and the mechanics rather than actually like constructing spaces um the area that I worked on was primarily an exploratory space, and then I just I looked at the space. We were, we created it for. Firstly, it had to be okay. What what do these labs look like, and how you know how would they exist in space? You know, they're in giant caverns in these big spheres and stuff. Okay, once we had that, it was a matter of well, how are you now going to get around these spaces using the portal gun? So really, I started with visual concepts. 
and then okay the player is going to have to navigate through all of these narrative spaces find gladys there are all of these narrative beats you have to hit but how is the player going to move around and i was like okay well i guess we're going to use um bouncy paint we can use the white paint and the speed paint and then Every so often, you'll just happen to have a white patch of wall that you can use the, the gun on. Figure out a way to get through the space, and it has to be different every time. You'd never want to recycle some of any of these elements, and you want to build the player up so they understand how you know, speeding into a portal works, and they understand bouncing into a portal and then shooting one on the floor before you land. Once we've taught all of these things, we start using them um, together in more complicated versions of these puzzles, you just go through that um, process. Eventually, the player is solving really complex problems because they know how each of these individual elements work because yeah. they've been through the space and used them prior mm -hmm. to that. Um, so this this particular section, it started with visual concepts and building the spaces that we thought were interesting, um, and then adapting or just basically adding the portal gameplay to their spaces. Mm -hmm. In the more in the test lab area, it was far more down to let's design the the puzzle in abstract because those test chamber spaces were one hundred percent adaptable to whatever yeah. puzzle you wanted to put in there. Like they only existed for the puzzle. They literally, I mean, the narrative was this is designed for this puzzle and this test. So yeah. again, it's like a gift from the narrative <laughs> design. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The just build all whatever out. you can imagine, and this is a test chamber, so it can be whatever you want it to be. Um, pretty mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, and I think, I think what's like kind of beautiful about Portal is that it has like such a natural gameplay flow and a progression for the player because, uh, like you were saying, there's like you start out with like here's your tutorial for how to utilize this mechanic, and then it slowly builds up, and then by the end you have this like great satisfaction of i understand what i need to do with the components i have and i can figure out the, the puzzle because i understand it uh yeah, yeah yeah exactly and you don't have your hand held at the end so you feel yeah. like you've actually accomplished something yeah, you've, you've thought you've thought it through yourself yeah but it doesn't feel it also doesn't some puzzle games i feel i don't know how to describe it but it's almost like you can feel the game designer in the background and they're like <laughs> look at how clever my puzzle is can you figure this yeah. out kind of thing but like <laughs> with portal it's uh it, it always just felt a lot more natural to me and more about the player than about uh, the designer i guess yeah, we definitely tried to wrap the tests in a layer of personality and misdirection so you're not focusing on the hand of the designer um yeah it was, re it was really helpful to have wheatley throughout things throughout the game it was really helpful to have the antagonist throughout the game um, otherwise it's kind of a lonely game right there's not really that much going on um so we we had ways to conceal that sort of raw game designer but like the hand of the game designer basically um yeah given how basic the elements were that that was i mean that was a danger we had that we had to sort of i mean the, the narrative layer really helped us with that yeah, and a lot of puzzle games sort of lack that, I think. It will often just be you sort of silently meandering through a series of puzzles or whatever. Some dreamy music in the background, maybe. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, and I mean, that's hard to keep players going when you don't have that um, that driving factor. Yeah. Uh, so, Half-Life Alex, uh, Again, sort of touched on it in the, the Half-Life 3 discussion, but uh, when did the discussion get sort of serious about creating a new Half-Life game, and uh, was it like entirely about utilizing the VR tech? Um, it was entirely about using VR. Right. We had, uh, we were developing the Index, and we had this um, chicken and egg situation of what's going to drive adoption of this platform? Is it going to be accessible technology? Is it going to be software that everybody wants to use? We thought, oh, it has to be both. Like, one can't really exist without the other. Um, and we weren't seeing people really going after, in a sort of um, a heavy investment way, 
the software side of things. Like, what is what is the killer app for this? Why do, why would people care about this? I mean, it's really really cool. Everybody puts these goggles on their face, like, wow, this is amazing, and it really really is incredible that way. Mm -hmm. um, but once you've been you've seen these test demos, and you know you've done your thirty minutes to sixty minutes in in VR, things start getting repetitive. So what is that? What is that? experience that we can do here like how can we how can we show that vr is superior in some ways to flat screen gaming mm -hmm. and we just we went through the different ips we tried um portal obviously with the lab um we Never tried left Dead. <laughs> well i mean yeah you have to be very careful with vr is uh, extremely polarizing if you start doing motion um, 50 percent of people or maybe more just get sick and they can't even do it so right. Ugh, that's a whole different discussion but uh -huh. um we had we had a left for dead test and it was terrifying and so we didn't want to do that um <laughs> it was just too, way too scary we had a tf2 test and everyone was getting sick um, and so Half-Life was just, it seemed like the best bet. Um, I, I started working on Half-Life Alex on day one with Robin Walker. Um, and I built a little test map that was kind of like Half-Life 2 uh, grade fidelity. And I put in there all of the things that I could think of that would translate well to uh, like a realistic scale scenario. Um, which, I mean, in hindsight, it's completely ridiculous. I ba basically had this key. You had to escape from this prison. You had to find this key and put it in the lock and turn the lock. And suddenly it was going, oh, gosh, now we don't just have a keyboard. So how do we do all of this stuff? Yeah, right. Um, so eventually we had like a 15, 20-minute demo. And it went across really well. You know, people were just blown away to be in a Half-Life space in with one-to-one -one scale, just being there was a, a big enough novelty but the first time people were fighting a head crab in vr and shooting up at a barnacle <laughs> they're like oh my god this is ridiculous i never knew that head crabs were this big or this scary yeah um and so we had to pull out the fast head crab because we put him in and they were just too terrifying <laughs> <clears throat> um but it just seemed like a really good ip to explore vr with uh-huh and and what were the goals for the game in terms of making sure it felt like a proper iteration in the Half Life series and like not just a, a tech demo for VR? Well, we wanted to make sure that we we knew that there weren't the number of people who wanted to play Half Life Three versus the number of people who were going to play Half Life VR it was a it was a big differential there. So we didn't want this to feel like the sequel that they missed out on. Yeah. Um, that's why we chose it to be a prequel. That's why we chose that you would be able to have this AAA experience, but it wouldn't have, it wouldn't bring the narrative forward enough that people were going to say, "Ask, you know, I missed out on this." Yeah. Um, but we wanted to make it full length enough because the experiment was, let's put out a AAA product on VR and see if that pushes the the medium forward. Like is. This is the this is the question we want answered. Is you know is it the chicken or the egg? Let's put the egg as the Half Life Alex and see what happens. Um, so that's what drove us to push it as far as we did because you know if we put out a half measure product or something, it was just a total waste of time. We didn't even answer our own question. Um, so that's why we pushed it as far as we did, and it ended up being way longer than we thought. I think. Our initial goal was eight hours or something like that. I think we ended up shipping 19 or 20 or something. Wow, yeah. Which is in true Valve fashion, yeah. overshooting. In true Half-Life fashion as well, by the sounds of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It must have been strange for you coming back to Half-Life, because it would have been a pretty massive gap uh, for you uh, working on all these other games. Um, what was it like coming back to the IP, I guess, after all that time? Um, yeah, it was a bit weird. Um, it was a nice bit of nostalgia there. <clears throat> um, actually, you know, it wasn't weird for long. It was easy to get back into the, the swing of things. Um, I think the, the novelty and excitement of doing it in VR overtook any kind of 
weirdness to begin with because I, I can tell you the very first experience I had in VR where I thought, okay, we have something here was I I think it was a bug or something where the weapons didn't appear or something like that. Or yeah, so I only had the, the, the pistol that I started with. And I ran out of ammo. And I was in this room with the first zombie in the map and I just realized I don't have anything to kill this guy with. Mm-hmm. So I was was in this room, it wasn't very big, it was like 10 foot by 10 foot with a table in the middle and I had to sort of dodge I had to sort of play this silly game of, in order to get out of the room I need, he was between uh, there was a zombie between me and the door, so I couldn't escape <clears throat> I couldn't kill him, so I just sort of goad him over to one side rush around the table rush through the door and then reach in through the door way to close the door, because there's, again, there's no button, there's no keyboard, right? You have to actually do all of this stuff physically. Yeah. And just the act of leaning in toward the zombie and grabbing the door handle and slamming the door shut before he swiped at me was just the most intense and nervous moment I've ever had in a video game, ever. Mm-hmm. I just thought, wow, if we can bottle that up, we have something pretty amazing here that you would never get on a flat screen game of any description whatsoever yeah and, um, and i thought yes this is what we need to do yeah i was think, like the big draw for vr i suppose well i mean there are a lot of draws uh, i suppose but one of them is sort of the freedom of movement that the player has uh, especially with their hands and uh, and things like that and their ability to do things like uh almost sort of against the design of the space <laughs> in a way how much effort was like put into placement of little objects and uh, little moments and things for purposes of like play, I suppose, uh, to create little like VR stories for the player. Yeah, there was uh, that. There was a lot. In short, there's a lot of density in that game um, because people. The good thing about immersion is that it really hits you deep. Um, it affects you emotionally. The bad thing about immersion is that it carries a ton of expectations where people. They think they're in the real space. They try to pick up everything and they try to interact with everything and they're disappointed with everything that doesn't behave in the way they expect it should. Um, So that just creates this requirement for if you want to maintain this immersion, you want to maintain this atmosphere that is so pungent, it's so powerful that you get this incredible emotional payoff when you get it right. Also, have the environment has to maintain that immersion, and so it took a lot of work and a lot of effort on the most mundane of details. Just, I mean, my friend Kerry Davis, I mean, he's just like the the, the nicest, most patient guy in the world, and he worked for four years on getting doors working properly, just door hinges and door handles, and I. You wouldn't believe how much work it takes Jeez. to get a VR door working. It's just insane. Um, every time you think that you've got it working, somebody comes in th- and says, oh, I thought that the door was supposed to rotate from this side. And I think, oh, yeah, of course you did, because that's how real doors work. <laughs> right. um, and that's just doors. And then there are drawers. I mean, drawer hinges and cupboard hinges and all of that stuff is just, wow. When it all works you don't even think about it, right? The, the players are just like, oh yeah, this just works. This must have been easy. But uh, no, it absolutely mm-hmm. was not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I guess I noticed things. I haven't played it because, I, I mean, I don't have a VR set on myself, but have I've watched gameplay of it. And I guess I was looking at little things like uh, there's a magic marker at one point, for instance, and you can use that to, like, draw uh, <laughs> like on Windows. Yeah. yeah. Things like that. Um Little bottles of in, liquid in them. Yeah, were there like entire meetings where you were just like, <laughs> what fun, like dumb little things can people do in VR that are going to be like exciting kind of thing? Uh, there were some of those, but a lot of those features came online because that was what somebody wanted to do. And yeah, um, either there was a narrative reason for it or it was a value add that somebody saw, you know, the benefit to, and then they just either talked to a designer to say, okay, how are we going to use this? Where are we going to put it? You know, where's, you know, where's the test bed for this thing? And they just did it. 
Um, or yeah, I, also we had cabals of people who were working on specific parts of the game. They would come up with some feature that they needed, and then we would all go and use that feature in our sections too. Right. The permanent marker department. Specifically, yeah. <laughs> right. Sometimes they would say, "Hey, have you got uh, have you got space to put this in your section of the game because it's not used enough?" Um, and we, you know, find places for it. Um, I, I loved. I mean, it was it was an extremely difficult project to work on because developing the hardware at the same time as developing the software was just a, a formula for frustration. But um, the, the biggest part that I worked on was in the inside the vault where there was all this anti gravity stuff happening, and I just thought to myself, "Wow, we're in we're in VR now. I want to do." the kinds of stuff that you would want to do in VR, not just be in a real space, but in a totally surreal space with yeah. no gravity. Like, what's that going to be like? What's it like to walk in an upside down room or to open a door into a room where the door falls away from you because gravity walls works differently in that room? Like, those kinds of things were just so... Again, this was almost like being given the gift of the Portal game design kit. Yeah. It's, it's something that nobody's done before. The, like the virtual reality, these these uh, these areas just have not been explored before, and the, the first time you experience them, they are awesome. And how cool is it to get to work on the game where people who are going through this, it's pretty much the first time they've done this. Um, mm -hmm. To me, that is a massive privilege, and it's extremely exciting to work for. Yeah, for sure. And, and it does seem like the ultimate goal for VR should be almost like... Uh... <laughs> create like there's the fun of creating a space like you were saying like the my house dot what of of vr or whatever where there's familiarity <laughs> exactly. in the space but the ultimate goal seems to be like how can we make experiences you could never have uh in the real world uh and sort of bring them to life through through a video game that's what i loved working in the on the vault section for it yeah. was the, the the familiar part was i don't know if you've you haven't played it, but you probably, I don't know if you remember that section, but it was basically chunks of apartment building that had been um, bitten off this, the top of this apartment building by the combine structure that housed the G-Man. Right, right, yep. And so you had this familiar sort of setting, but everything was working in strange ways, like there were strange gra anti-gravity wells and stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, I just loved working on it. I experimented, experimented with so many different things, like different scales. Like you would look through a, a window and you'd be looking at exactly the same room that you were in, but it was a tiny little um, old house size. Or the other, the other thing, you'd be walking down a corridor and when you turned around, the corridor you came from was totally different. And then you turned around again and that one was different. And it's like, you've no idea where you are. And turning around and suddenly you were up against a wall and you're, now you're in a closet. Like yeah. there were some really amazing things that you could do with that because you're in VR and the immersion was just handing you this 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 gift of you have this very, very powerful thing to use and you don't have to do much in order to get that really big um, sort of emotional impression on the player. Yeah. So yeah, really interesting medium for mm -hmm. sure. Really fun project to work on. Uh yeah, I guess I was wondering, like, how it must have been pretty different building levels uh, visually, I would think, for a VR game in terms of, like, you would probably have to do quite a lot of different things for, like, drawing the player's eye and indicating progression and, and things like that, I would think, uh, in a VR space versus a sort of a regular level. Were there sort of challenges with that kind of thing? Uh, for leading the player through to get to the right place, you mean? Yeah, things like that. Um... I think the basic principles are pretty similar. Um, I think where it would differ would be what are the interactive elements that we want the player to understand? Yeah. Versus, because you can't make all of the world interactive, because um, then you're just like world simulation and it's not that fun. Mm -hmm. um, but you want players to think that they have agency to solve puzzles without feeling too lead um but they also want to solve puzzles that feel um intuitive because a uh, vr is all about the intuitive operation of things like instead of pressing 
E or whatever to open a door, you're actually turning the door handle because that's how you do it. And so the challenge, I think, was designing puzzles that are intuitively um, discoverable um, but aren't, you know, don't require you to put so much work into the rest of the environment that the player will never interact with and thus, you know, get distracted by or whatever. So I think that was a pretty fine balance to, to draw. Yeah. And I guess you were talking about that disappointment factor of like what the player can and can't interact with as well. Right. So yeah. Yeah, lots of challenges there, I think. Uh, uh, you sort of talked about how, uh, I guess as you went through each game, you were like, well, this was a mod for this and <clears throat> this was a mod for this game and, and such. Uh, over the years, Valve is sort of quite famous for picking up talent from modding communities. I mean, I guess you, uh, to begin with, Doom, Doom modding, and then uh, Dota, obviously, uh, CS. Portal was like a college demo, I think. Uh, why do you think other companies sort of shy away from doing that same thing when it's been like such a successful uh, thing for Valve? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I'm trying to, the first thing I would think of, not because I don't know the decision making in these other companies, I would just try to start speculating. My first thing was, is it has it been really difficult? Um, yeah, and some sometimes taking. Taking an idea and actually, you know, polishing it into a AAA project, that can be difficult sometimes because you're onboarding the team at the same time as doing the project. Uh -huh. But not difficult enough for, for us to decide it w was a bad idea. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe the difficult... Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to speculate and I'd probably be wrong. <laughs> I guess I, as a Dota player, I always think of... Uh, Blizzard having the opportunity to buy Dota at some point and not doing it, <laughs> which uh, yeah, I, I don't know a ton about that, but I, that's that is an interesting question. Like, yeah, why? I don't know how that all went down, to be honest. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, so, oh uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk about sort of you recently come back to Doom. Uh, what made you like come back to the community essentially? Um, I think. I don't know how I found this, but I uh, I came across a Doom World thread about these maps that I had. That, it was Punisher and Punish Two that I'd put out on a CD-ROM way back in the day. And I thought, oh my god, I remember that. I really want to play this. And I played it, and I thought I should record myself playing through this because it's the first time in so long. And I really enjoyed recording that demo and then putting it on YouTube and then reconnecting with the community. Um, and that really started everything off. And then I realized just how big this community was still after 28 years. And yeah. that's just amazing. In fact, I would go back a little bit. Um, prior to me reading that Doom World thing, I saw on YouTube Big Mac Davis doing his run through Plutonia, ex Plutonia experiment. Oh, yeah. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. This guy is really entertaining to watch. He's really funny, and I watched his entire series playing through Plutonia Expo, and I thought, huh, you know, I want to play some Doom again. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how it started, really, was him. Right, and, and I, I noticed, like, even in your first couple of videos of, of playing since you came back, that you seem to, like, remember quite a lot of the old skills. Uh, <laughs> like, your BFG usage was surprisingly good for someone who hadn't played in quite a while, and, and your general mechanics and stuff. Uh, have you, like, come back to Doom in bits and pieces over the years? Like, would you occasionally fire it up and play, or, or not really? No, never. Never. Interesting. That uh, was, uh, I mean, I didn't even, yeah, that was the first time in an extremely long time. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I also heard you say that you don't actually play Doom with the music on at all. Uh, is this limited <laughs> to Doom, or is this uh, something you do with other games as well? Uh, this is not... Li no. Well, back in the day I used to listen to the music. Um, I don't know why I don't do that anymore. I think, well, I, do, I, I don't like hearing repetition. I don't like hearing the same, whatever, it's like three-minute song over and over and over and over and over. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I think I just forget it as well. I think I forget to turn the music on because I turned the music on when I was playing Valiant Map 31, which which by the way is just 
unbelievable. What an incredible map that is. <laughs> yeah. What an incredible experience that uh, that map is. And I turned on the music about halfway through, and I just really liked the music, and the music fit the theme so well that I thought it just added a ton mm -hmm. to that map. Um, so I totally get the value of music in these, and I... I I don't really have a very good excuse for why I keep turning it off. Oh, well, okay, I do have an excuse. Uh, that is because I leave Doom... I have tons of windows open my computer, and I leave Doom in the background. And before I realized you could hit pause that stopped all of the sound, I just hit escape, and it was in the menu, and then the music would be playing in the background. I'd say, oh, I've got to turn this off because it's right, annoying me. Okay. So I would lower the music, and I would never come back and turn it back on again. The villain origin story. It all makes sense. <laughs> Uh, well, um, uh, skill saw ones in particular are probably quite good to leave the music on for because uh, you know stuff like Ancient Aliens. He works with a guy called Stewboy, who he actually creates like a properly like cultivated soundtrack for the levels rather than just randomly picked midis. So the music is actually like made for the map specifically and stuff. So that uh, really shows too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really good. Uh, do do you? Do you think of like music as important to level design then, or do you generally uh, <laughs> treat it as like an incidental tool uh, for sort of moments, I guess, rather than like, I guess Doom has more sort of background music. Well, it it certainly looks like I don't give a crap about it, doesn't it? <laughs> um, but that's not true. Um, so in Left 4 Dead 2, I built the rock concert level, and. When I was testing, like the in, in original tests of it, it was before the Midnight Riders were invented. And so for the playtests, I had to put some music in for when the, the rock concert started. So I put uh, Bad to the Bone and Killing in the Name of. Uh -huh. And when those songs started in the playtests and people were blasting zombies away and listening to this awesome music, I thought, this is the, this is the coolest level in Left 4 Dead 2 <laughs> by a long way because the music just adds so much. Like you, When you get the music with the right tone and the attitude, yeah. it changes everything. Exactly. Um, so I was pretty upset when uh, Doug Lombardi, here I'm calling him out, I'm shaming him publicly, Doug Lombardi said, no, we're not going to use that music. I was like, ah... Oh. Really? But it's like the coolest thing ever. So yeah, I totally understand the value of uh, music and games. Um, I just have some kind of strange sickness where I completely don't think about it and doom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I don't right. know what's going on with it. Uh, well, uh, to the final question of the podcast, and, and I ask this of all of my, my guests, um, what is your favorite doom monster and why? Ooh, um... Picking just one. Probably... Um, a few people oh will pick, goodness. like, uh, their favorite design and then maybe their favorite to use uh, in maps and stuff as well, if that's more... I popular. really like... I really like uh, Revenants because... Shocking, yeah. They're very... Yeah. <laughs> they... They're maddening, though, because the, the, the homing missiles are maddening, but I have a lot of respect for them. And they're very, very flexible placement-wise. So just from a level design point of view, um, they make you stop in your tracks, really. And, I mean, is there any better death sound than the breaking bones? I mean, <laughs> come on. There are a lot of... The pinky, pretty good. Mancubus. So, um... <laughs> yeah. Great ones. Uh, but the, the bone-breaking sound, especially when you're rocketing say a, a group yeah, of 10 yeah. or 11 uh <laughs> it's so so uh rewarding i i don't know that's a very good question i've never really thought about that in all of these years um but yeah i'd probably say the revenant a good choice not the chain gunner then they're also pretty frequently uh <laughs> used you know what i i should not take I, I can't take responsibility for the chain gunners milo was the chain gunner guy he's the one Put. I mean, yeah, I put a chain gunner right behind one of the spawn points in one of the maps. Um, <laughs> well, that was for was, Milo, right? Sorry. Like, that was specifically <laughs> for him. That was so, yeah, it was to kill him straight away. Uh, but yeah, the chain gunner is, he's cool because, you know, you can he can get you way further than you can get him. Uh, cool is one word but, for that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's not really the right word for it, is it? Um, 
But uh, I think the Revenants get my bet. And it's a very close race between them and the Mancubus and probably the Cyberdemon. Yeah, I have a big Cyberdemon. Well, no, no way. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the. I do like the, uh, I mean, the Archvile is pretty cool because they do create some really good, I mean, how how close do you get to have a puzzle in Doom? But with those guys you do because you don't want to let them get anywhere near monsters or dead bodies. Um, they're always a target priority for you. And they're fairly resilient, so, I mean, they're, they're pretty interesting too, but I think the Revenants have to take it. It's a, it's a solid choice, definitely. Uh, you're good. in good company. I think a lot of uh, solid mappers have picked the Revenants. So. No shame. Okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, well, yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to be on. Uh, it was an honor, really, to, to talk to you about all these games you've worked on. Uh, huge fan of so many of them. And, and obviously, Plutonia was a, was a really big deal for me uh, when I was younger and definitely uh, became, like, a huge influence for my own, uh, like, mapping stuff for Doom. So... Very That's sad. really nice to, uh, to hear. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, um, well, it's been a pleasure being on here. It's been really fun talking about all this stuff. Um, my favorite subject, of course. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, anytime. I might have to <laughs> try and get to Milo somehow as well. I'd love to hear his uh, thoughts on go to it and. Yeah, you know, I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll message him and see uh, if he would like to do something like this. Um, maybe once um, this is done and it's published, I'll he can listen to it and then see if he would like to do one of these yeah uh that sounds great well yeah thanks again and um i guess for everyone listening uh this is this is the end of the podcast so you can pack it up and uh, i'll be back next time with a uh, with another guest so yeah see you later dario right. and uh, everyone else thank you so much see you next time yep bye, bye.